welcome everybody here. And uh, we're going to uh, devote, uh, dedicate our day, day to prayer. And, um, and uh, so let us pray. <clears throat> Ite matu i runga rawa tu kuna tu nei matu reo fuka mai miti kia koe o manakta nui i runga a matau i te nei ra na matau i haere tafiti mai matau hoki i haere tata mai ko tai pai matau i rara te nei tu i nui te nei ra tu kuna tu nei matu reo fuka mai miti kia koe a mo a manakta nui i runga a matau i te nei ra no re re te atua kai te mohi o nei matau nau i karanga tēnei hui. Kia uhuhi tahi ai mātou, ki raro i tēnei kaupapa, ki a pikiake nei o mātou nei mōhi o tanga, ki te tiriti, ki ngā ahua tanga katoa e pāna ki te tiriti. Nō re te atua, anere a mātou e koropiko nei i mua i āko e tēnei i tēnei ata. Mō tēnei kaupapa ata ahua, nā ue homai ki a mātou i tēnei rā. Nō reire te atua, i nua te na mātou ki a koe, ki a manākitia mai mātou katoa. Tēnā tēnā o mātou i haramai nei, mai i tērā taki wā, i tērā wāhi, i tēnei wāhi hoki. Nō reire te atua, te akina manākitia mai mātou i tēnei rā. Ki a hei mātou ki te huakina mai, ki te whakatūwhera mai, o mātou ngākau, o mātou hiningaro, O mātou whatumanoa ke a koe, ki wāau, kōrero, ki tāu e pai ai. Nō reira tō mātou inoe ke a koe, ko ngā mea papai, ngā mea tika, i roto i ngā kōro katoa te rānei, ka whakauungia ke rote o mātou, ke a kore nei mātou e wareware, ke a piriponua i mātou ke a koe te atua. Hoena ko ngā kōrero kāre pai ana, kāre tika ana, ko tāu, Tō mātou inoa ki a koe, tangohia, koe nga kōrero, ki a koua e whai wāhi ki roti o mātou tinana, ki roto hoki o mātou wairua, o mātou ngāko, o mātou hiningaro rānei. Nō e te atua tia kina manākiti e mai mātou, ki nga tingo tō tātou kai whakarui hukaraiti, āke tonu atu. Āmene. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have guided us here. Father, you have called this day. Because, uh, probably because there is a desire in your heart that we lack, do not lack in knowledge. Especially knowledge about uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. So, Father, we thank you for calling this day. And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us safely here. Those of us who arrived. Uh, from places far away and from places nearby. Father, we are just so grateful that we are here. We are together. We thank you, Lord, for this nation. We thank you for this country. We thank you for the peoples that you have brought to this land. Lord, we know, Lord, that, that all people have been brought here by you. So, Father, we thank you for that. And I know, Father, that you have, you, you, you have a plan for this country. And you have a desire in your heart for this country. <clears throat> Father, and it's our desire to, to try to fulfill your desires for this nation. Lord, we thank you for this land. We thank you for this nation. We thank you, Father, for <clears throat> the beautiful things that you have placed in this land when you created it, Father. So we thank you also for your presence in this country, in this nation. I also want to thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord, for making this church available. We thank you for the leadership, for opening their hearts up to have this uh, meeting today. So, Father, we dedicate this time to you, and we pray a blessing over Mason and over all people who will be sharing today. We pray for each individual who have come. We pray, Father, that for, their, for their organizations, for their churches, from which they have come. And we pray, Lord, that uh, this meeting today will not only be a blessing to the individuals that are here, but also to the organizations that they represent. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts, open our minds, 
open ourselves to receive what is of you today. <clears throat> and Father, we pray also that, uh, that everything will be blessed and that we'll have a blessed time. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> I'd just uh, like to ask uh, maybe uh, Steve and Tanya if they could, or Fano, if they, maybe they could lead in the song. And, I, and of course, Alan will be coming forward to do some devotions also. Uh, but uh, so, Alan, could, we, could you come forward, please? Yes. <clears throat> Kia ora te whanau. It's uh, wonderful to uh, see you all and uh, I too want to add my thanks for making the effort to come. Uh, Saturdays are precious these days. We lead busy lives and uh, to give a day to look at matters to do with the treaty is uh, truly a, uh, a blessed thing and I'm glad that you've made the time and thank you for for coming. I really hope that you feel at home here at Central. We count it a great privilege to be able to uh, host this uh, here today and uh, to be able to have worked with Monty on this has truly been uh, a wonderful thing. Just an opening, I'd like to uh, share a few verses from what I think is one of the great passages of Scripture. It's one of these majestic, uh, one of these sort of very lofty uh, passages of scripture that um, is found in Colossians chapter 1 uh, entitled The Supremacy of Christ and uh, what I'd like to do is actually read the NIV version first and then to read to you Eugene Peterson's uh, uh, interpretation of the same passage because um, like with so much of uh, his uh, translation in the message he puts a fresh spin on it he being Jesus, this is Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, he being Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Eugene Peterson's translation. We look at the sun and see God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this very moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes it, he organizes it and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning, and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood, that poured down from the cross. I love it. All the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, 
get properly fixed and fitted together. In the NIV version, verse 17, all things hold together by Christ. He sustains the universe and it is his desire to harmonize and reconcile all things. And perhaps more than anything, when we begin to talk about the treaty, we're talking about this incredibly huge biblical idea of reconciliation and peace and harmony. And we're here because that, that, that beats in our hearts. It throbs in our chest, doesn't it? Because that's the heartbeat of God, that that might be true. As it is in heaven, so it would be on earth. And uh, we would love to see that in greater, greater measure and fulfillment amongst the people of this land, Māori and Pākehā. And so verse 20 reminds us that it's through him and in him that all things are reconciled, whether things on earth or things in heaven. It can only be through Christ ultimately. And all of the various constitutions and whatever else man makes may be helpful, but ultimately there is only one way in which all people will find reconciliation, and it is through the cross of Christ, because he has made peace already with us and offers peace to us because of his blood shed on the cross. So that's, that's what it's all about, the supremacy of Christ. He is great, he is majestic, and he's worthy of our praise. Teo and Steve, come and lead us in a song. Kia ora koutou. Would you be, would you please stand? Mohio koutou tēnei waiata? Aye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
just for ourselves, but for our nation, for the peoples of this country, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Cover us, Lord. May we know your grace, your wisdom, your love. May we know your reconciliation ministry amongst ourselves, Lord. And we offer ourselves in this day, Lord, may this not be just another seminar, may it, but may it be a, a day of high impact, of renewed inspiration, of fresh conviction, so that we may serve you better in our world. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We turn our Bibles to Joshua 9, Joshua chapter 9. <clears throat> now we know the story that uh, Joshua had uh, crossed the Jordan and was now in the process of taking the land back. <clears throat> and he had conquered a number of people. And there was this group of, uh, <clears throat> just in verse 3, however, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they, res they res resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on, their feet and walled clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. So the Gibeonites came to Joshua to make a treaty. The men of Israel said to the Hevites, But perhaps you, have, you live near us. How then can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, who are you, and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God, for we have heard reports of him, all that he had done in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan. Again, they repeat the comment in, um, we are, in verse 11, we are your servants, make a treaty with us. Verse 12, this bread of ours was warm, warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord. They didn't ask the Lord for anything. Then Joshua, verse 15, then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Later on, of course, Joshua finds out that he was actually tricked into making a treaty with the Gibeonites. <clears throat> in fact, in verse 16, it says, three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. 
So the Israelites set out, and on the third day came to the, these very cities. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. In other words, they kept and honored the treaty. Although they were tricked into making that treaty, they honored it. They honored it. Okay. Now let's turn to Second Samuel 21. I think in, in, in years, I think we're talking about maybe 400 years later, uh, the, the time from, uh, from Joshua to, da uh, to David. Verse 1, it says that during the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. Can you imagine that? A famine for three years? So David sought the face of, of the Lord. So he sought God. The Lord said, he, he said, God, you know, he asked, obviously asked God, why are we having this famine? The Lord said, it is on account of, of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Remember they had made this treaty with the Gibeonites 400 years before. Now they're having a drought in the land because Saul killed some of the Gibeonites. The treaty was that the Israelites would never kill the Gibeonites. That was the treaty. An imperfect treaty, tricked into making that treaty, but God is still saying 400 years later, you have to honor that treaty. Because if you don't, I will bring a famine to your land. Well, that's huge, really. Um, interesting thing, and here's the king, king, king of the Jews, David. He summons the Gibeonites because he wants to speak to them. Verse 3, David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? In other words, he, he has a heart to put this, to put this right. What, what shall I do for you? How shall I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? So he wants the famine to finish and, the, uh, and, and he wants go the Lord's blessings. Interesting answer in verse 4. I, this is a really interesting answer, the Gibeonites answering. The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold or gold from Saul. In other words, they didn't want money. They didn't want money. Or his family. Nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. It's an interesting answer. So David... Uh, he says, what do you want me to do for you? In other translations, he says, listen, I, want, I will do anything. I will do anything for you. Okay. I think he was quite relieved that they didn't want any silver and gold. You know, he's really quite relieved about that. So he said, listen, I'll give you anything. They answered the king. As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us, so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel. Let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and exposed before the Lord at Gilbert, the Lord's chosen one. In other words, this is, we don't want your gold, we don't want your silver, but give us seven male descendants. And in some translations it says to be hanged before the Lord as restitution. So the king said, I will give them to you. Now he doesn't give Jonathan because he's already made a, an agreement with Jonathan previously. But he does give seven male descendants of Saul to be hanged unto the Lord as restitution for a broken treaty which was imperfect. They were tricked into making it. So it was, it's not about a perfect treaty, it's, but it's about a treaty and an honoring of a treaty. 
And of course, when all of the things were done, you can work, read later on in the passage, when all of that was done, the famine ceased in Israel. So the question is, you know, how does this relate to the Treaty of Waitangi? I suppose there are a lot of parallels here. One was the treaty is not a perfect treaty. Neither was the treaty with the Gibeonites a perfect treaty. But nevertheless, it was a treaty that God wanted to be honored. The treaty was made in, in New Zealand, an agreement between two nations, as this was, an agreement between two nations. Does God want us to honor the treaty? If so, and how does he want us to honor it? Is it still relevant? After all, it's a hundred and how many years later? Uh, remember, in the case of the Gibeonites, we're talking about 400 years later, when the Lord still wanted the treaty to be honored. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is this book, the book of truth? Is this, is this book, the Bible, the book that we should live by in New Zealand? Should we honor this book and what it says? Or should we just throw it away and just uh, live according to our rules and our regulations in New Zealand, our policies, man-made. These are the questions that are confronting us right now in our country. And uh, today, my, my prayer today is that all of you will be much more knowledgeable about the treaty at the end of this day. And also that you will be able to articulate, really, uh, that is Mason's heart, that you are able to articulate what he is saying in, in here. Uh, not just to listen and to say, oh, that was really good, but to become part of the, uh, the disciples, if you like, for want of a better word, of the treaty, and to, to be able to articulate, not its, maybe not in its entirety, but you know, a lot of important statements that Mason will make today. When we were organizing this uh, meeting, uh, Alan and I were speaking, talking about things, and we thought it would be really good to hold a Treaty of Waitangi seminar, especially for our Christians, Christian brothers and sisters, because it is, I suppose, it is, it is important to have the knowledge, to have the, the right ideas, to... Now, and not to be pontificating or, or just you know pick, plucking things from out of the air. Uh, it's it's not it's not the time for that. Actually, the time now is to get become very factual. To get to get the facts, to and to and to go from there, rather than to go from some kind of, some kind of you know ideas based or notions based approach. So I suppose why, what, what I wanted to do was to say that the Treaty of Waitangi is biblical. It is part of, it was God, part of God's plan, and we as Christians now need to think about where we stand in this particular area. Kia ora. Is it, can we see, anybody else want to sing another song? We'll sing another song, and then uh, get Alan to it. Yeah. answer that question because uh, <laughs> I might uh, I don't want to I know that Mason will answer that question today um, and um, I have an answer for it but what I'll do is if Mason doesn't answer it then I'll answer it later on during the day okay 
but I'm sure that he will cover it. Etu uh, Tato, if you'd like to stand and we'll sing together. This beautiful song, Ete Ariki Whakarungo Maira Kia Mato, which means, God hear us, your people. How many people know the Tene Waita, this Waita? Well, Kia Kaha, Puaha, sing really loud. I don't want to do any solos. E te ariki torufa, e te ariki whakarongo, whakarongo mai e pakia. He's arrived. <laughs> Which is uh, a good time for us to stop and have morning tea. <laughs> Give him a moment to uh, get a little bit of a caffeine fix and then uh, get his uh, laptop uh, connected up and then we should be away. So we're going to have morning tea. There are two stations out there in the caf, uh, tea and coffee, and uh, we're going to pause now for just a quarter of an hour and uh, then we'll get, get underway with... Uh, Professor Jerry. So um, please enjoy some coffee. Um, the calf tables are set up. Yeah, feel free to go outside. Uh, this, it's nice to uh, just sit out there for a little bit. Um, and. Uh ah, kia ora, kia ora tātou katoa te whānau. Ko huhi tahi mai nei, raru tēnei tuanui tēnei ata. Te tuanui o te atua. I te tīmatanga te kupu i te atua, te kupu ko te atua nō tēnei kupu i te tīmatanga. Nā nā ngā mea katoa i hanga, kāre hoki te tahi mea kore te hanga e i a ngā mea i hanga. I whaka kiko kiko tia te kupu noha nei a mātou ki tāna mātou i tāna kororia. He kororia rite a nā ki tō te tamako tahi a te atua, ki i tonu i te aroha noa i te pono, ti hei mauri ora. Piki mai kake mai, homa i te wai ora, ki āwe tūtehu ana, 
Kwera te moia te kui e te pō, pō wairaka i raru ai e. E papaki tū ana ngā taiki mau wao. Ka ao, ka ao, ka ao te rā. <coughs> e mihi ana rā, ki te ātai rangi kāhu e noho mai rā i rungi tahu rewa ona mātu ana tipuna, tana hoa hoki a whatumona me te kāhu i ariki. E mihi ana hoki kia, kia kōtou tainui waka, <coughs> Tēnā koutou ko a hua kina mai te kuaha, ka kuhuna mai tēnei kaupapa te, i te rānei. Nō reira tainui waka tēnā koutou. <coughs> Ngā kārangaranga maha katoa, ko tau nei tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou ko tai mai nei. Tēnā koe mehana. Tēnā koe rangi tāne. Me ngā iwi katoa o roto o manawatu. Tēnā koe nau mai haramai. Tēnā tātou o tātou tini ai tua o tātou mate. I hinga nei, hinga nā i ngā tōpito e whāo te motu. I nui hoki i rātau. Ko te mate kē, ka hinga, ko hinga ngā tōtara nui o te wānui ātāne, ara rātau, <coughs> E matatau ana ki tō tātou reo rangatira, e tino kahana hoki ki te wero mō te iwi Māori, mō Aotearoa. Me rātou hoki e pupuri ana te Māori i ngā marae, e nui hoki rātou, wāhine, tāne, me ngā tamariki mokopuna hoki. Nō rere miha na rākea rātou katoa i ngā mate, haere koutou, haere koutou, haere koutou. Ko ki atu rā koutou ki te kāinga tūturu mō tātou ko tō te tangata, moi mai, moi mai, moi mai i roti tariki. E tika ana me wahi o rātou ki a rātou, nā ko tātou ko tō te hungora, tēnā tātou ko tōa. Meihana kai te hari o mātou ngākau. Tino hari, tino koa. Nō te mea ko tāi mai koe. Ranga tira. Tō hunga i roto i ngā mahi i. O te mātau ranga, o te hauora, ngā mahi o te kāwana tanga, ngā ture, he tōhunga hoki o te tiriti o waitangi. Nō reira nō mai, hara mai. Hara mai ki roto o hāmutana, ki roto hoki o te waka o tai nui. Hara mai. Ara mai ki runga te aroha. Kei te mōhine i mātuko i pekātu rā koe ki ngā mokopuna, i nga pō, i nga nahi. Nō reire i mihana rā ki tō whānau, ki tō hoa rangatira, arohia, me a kōrua tamariki, me a kōrua mokopuna. Mā te atua kōtou katoa i manāki tia ki ngā mā katoa. Tēnā koe hoki i te whare wānanga o Manawatu, me ngā kaupapa ko oti rā i au koutou i reira, ngā kaupapa ātāhua, tino ātāhua rawātu. Nō reira ngā mihi nui rā ki au koutou katoa, o te tari i Māori, me ngā Māori katoa i roto i tērā tari, i roto i tērā tari, i roto i tērā tari. Nō reira tēnā koe. Te arawa tēnā koe. Tēnā koutou ko tāi mai nei tēnei rā. Ngā whanaunga, o te arawa waka, koutou hoki o tauranga moana, nau mai hara mai. Koutou hoki o tāmaki makaurau, ko tai mai nei i tēnei rā, ngā mihi nurea kia koutou katoa. Nure ngā hau e whā, tātou katoa ko huihu mai nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ka mea ihu, ko ahau te huarahi, ko ahau te pono, ko ahau te ora e korera o e te tahi tangata. E haere ake aue ki te matua, ki te kahore ahau. Nō reire kāpi 
ti hoa nō tātou hono ko rātou te hunga matika rātou ko tātou ko tō te hunga ora no hō nei i raru te maru maru tō tātou matu nui te rangi tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa Tuatahi tainui, waka tainui, tēnā kouta. O tira tarangatira tēnā rā koe, e nau e mihi mai ki tēnei. A kia tātou katoa, i rotu i tēnei piringa whare e tū mai nei. Nō reira mihi mai, mihi mai. Mihi mai kia mātou, i rotu i ngā tini aitua e pāna kia tātou. Ko ngā tini mat, i hinga mai, i runga i ngā marae maha o te motu, o tira haere rātou. Engari, ko tātou nei e te honga ora, a tēnā nō tātou. A tēnā tātou, i rotu i te tino a tāhua tango o tēnei kaupapa, ko te kawenata o Waitangi. Ahakoa ngā piki ngā heke. Ko au nei, ko tēnei tētahi o ngā tūmanako mō ngā rā e heke mai nei. O tira i rotu i nei whakaaro, a tēnā koutou. Thank you, Monty, for the welcome and for inviting me to spend some time with you today here. And it's good to see my niece Val here. At least there's one person who'll be able to sing my waiata. If that is required. Good to see you though, Val. And I apologise for the lateness. I uh, can, can attribute it to two things. Uh, I, I spent the night at Tauranga and missed the turn off to Hamilton and started going to Auckland instead and realised when I was halfway to Auckland that it was getting warmer. <laughs> when it was supposed to be getting colder. <laughs> so so uh, retract here. The other, the other, of course, the other reason for the slight delay is to do with uh, modern technology and connecting up the PowerPoint. And we thought we had it sussed, then we realised that uh, all these things are designed so that one system doesn't fix, fit into another system. So that you could never kind of uh, guarantee that all these computers are going to fit in with each other. If you want the biblical reference, I think it's to do with the Tower of Babel. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Uh, the, the issues before us today really is, is to uh, look at the Treaty of Waitangi so that at the end of the day uh, we, we won't understand uh, the entirety of the issues and we, we won't uh, necessarily agree on all the issues. And that's not the point. The, the point is that we have uh, a little more understanding of an issue that confronts New Zealand, if not the world, uh, today. And, and so that's really all, uh, all that I intend to do, is to introduce you to some of the issues. And I thought I'd do it um, by uh, talking it initially about uh, the reasons why the treaty was signed and perhaps what the treaty actually says. Then we'll have lunch. <laughs> well, it'll take just a little while to do that. <laughs> then we'll have lunch. Uh, but what I'd quite like to do, maybe during lunch, is just to get some uh, thoughts from you about the issues in particular that would, you would like us to focus on in the first part of the afternoon. Uh, I've got a whole lot of things I'd like to talk about, but I'd really prefer it if there were particular issues you want to focus on so that when we uh, come back after lunch, we, we move towards the direction that interests you in particular. So my task this morning then is simply to explain the background to the treaty and what the treaty actually says as a platform for developing other issues this afternoon. So uh, we might just, uh, Monty, have to have some way of uh, collecting the, uh, the agenda for the afternoon, eh? perhaps around about lunchtime. Now the other, uh, other thing I apologise for is that the, the, uh, the PowerPoint is not as uh, as grand as the one I saw when I walked in here today. It's, it's a small thing. If you can't see it clearly, don't worry too much. Uh, it's really a guide for me so that I can remember what to keep on track. 
And uh, if, if, the, um, if you can't read the words, I'm, I'm, uh, really, they're just really a, a guide so that it's not critical. And I'll just put this on here because I'm going to uh, go on the other side. And so I can operate, operate this uh, issue here. Now the... Uh, It must be terrible in the old days when they didn't have microphones and videos and, uh, and computers. Uh, but our children, of course, will never be able to remember those days, just as uh, most of us have trouble remembering life without electricity. But um, the, uh, the starting point, really, that uh, I thought we'd look at is that the Treaty of Waitangi was actually a compromise. It was, and when we're talking about the treaty, really what we're talking about is the development of New Zealand as a modern state. Uh, New Zealand joined the world, so to speak, as a, as a, uh, as a, a new state in the world in 1840, and the Treaty of Waitangi was how New Zealand became a modern nation. Prior to 1840, it was uh, not regarded as a nation in the sense of having a governance, governing arrangement and being part of the international community. After 1840, that's what it became. And the Treaty of Waitangi was the vehicle which took New Zealand into the modern world. Well, you may not think 1840 is very modern, but in, uh, it, it made New Zealand part of the international community. So the treaty is as much really about New Zealand's birth as a modern state as it is about other things. Now, uh, it was a compromise. In, in, um, in 1840, New Zealand could have developed in two directions. It could have developed as an entirely Maori nation. Now, that was on the agenda in 1835. It could have developed as a republic. That was on the agenda in 1839. There was a good chance that New Zealand would become a republic, what some people would, would have called today a banana republic, because it was going to be done in an in a ad hoc sort of way, but it could have become a republic. And neither of those things happened, and instead the, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi provided the compromise between those two options a Maori nation on the one hand, a republic on the other. And what I just wanted to do is talk a little bit about those two options, how they came about and why they never happened, and why instead the treaty happened. Because it was the treaty that really gave birth to New Zealand, more or less as we know it today, as part of the international community. Now, there are a whole lot of people that uh, played a part in developing this, and, and I, uh, I, I don't plan to uh, dwell on them all, uh, but there are some names that stand out, and the name that I just want to, the person I just want to start with, is a man called James Busby. Any of you uh, descended from him? <laughs> no, he, he, uh, he uh, did, has descendants in New Zealand. Uh, the ones I know of live on the East Coast, and there are probably others as well. Uh, anyway, he, uh, Busby's a point, uh, perhaps a starting point. He was a, um, a man who, who uh, joined the civil service in uh, England. He, uh, in, uh, in the time we're talking about, the 1830s, the biggest government department in Great Britain was the colonial office. It was a huge department, and its job was to look after the British colonies all around the world. Britain, of course, had established uh, in those days, the British Empire was a huge structure with colonies in every, uh, all around uh, the globe, 
and the colonial office used to look after them. That was their job, to, to administer the colonies. Busby worked in the colonial office and managed to get a job in New South Wales as an assistant to the governor of New South Wales. Now, he didn't get on with his boss. He, uh, they, they argued uh, constantly. Uh, and one of the things they argued about was New Zealand. Uh, the governor of New South Wales in those days, one of his jobs was to uh, keep an eye on New Zealand, provide, in, provide information to the colonial office about who was going to New Zealand and who was coming and uh, how many convicts escaped and left Australia and went to New Zealand and how many didn't come back. Uh, and Busby thought that the information that was being sent to England gave the wrong picture about New Zealand. So he, uh, he thought that uh, if Britain wanted to know about New Zealand, the best way of knowing about it was to send someone there. So he went back to London, managed to get himself recalled to the colonial office. While he was there, he proposed that there should be a British resident in New Zealand someone who would report directly to the colonial office instead of going through New South Wales. He wrote out a job description. He was the only applicant. <laughs> and before he knew where he was, he had secured himself a job in New Zealand as, as the British resident. Now, uh, if you read the books, they, they will tell you that Busby was an absolute failure. Uh, he never did anything that his job description said he was supposed to do. He was supposed to keep the peace between the tribes and the settlers. Well, the reverse happened. It got worse, not better. He was supposed to keep the peace between the tribes. Well, that, even then, that was an impossible task. It, it would, would not be much easier today, but it was uh, very difficult then. And, uh, <laughs> and he failed to do that. And he was supposed to keep law and order, and he didn't do that. He couldn't do that. There was no British law in New Zealand in 1835, and so he, he had no way of keeping the law. The only, and he didn't have any guns, he didn't have a police force, so he couldn't, uh, couldn't impose might on anyone. Uh, all he had was moral persuasion, and he was expected to uh, appeal to the better sentiments of people to get them to live alongside each other. And he, he wasn't able to do that. But more than anyone else, it was Busby that contributed to the development of the Treaty of Waitangi. I suspect, had he not been British resident in New Zealand, New Zealand's future would have been very, very different. Now, he, um, what he, uh, one of the first things he did when he uh, came to New Zealand, in, in 1834, he called all the chiefs together and said, uh, what you guys need is a flag. You need a New Zealand flag. And the reason he argued that was that uh, even in 1834, ships were being built in the northern part of New Zealand, and those ships were sailing around the Pacific, including to Australia. And the question came up, if they sailed out of New Zealand, what flag should they fly? They were built in New Zealand, they left New Zealand, what flag? and Busby thought that they should fly a New Zealand flag. But there wasn't a New Zealand flag. So he called the chiefs together, 34 or 35 chiefs, and said to them, we need a flag. The chief said, uh, do we? Uh, not, not sure why, but Busby uh, said, oh yes, if you go into international waters, you need a flag. And then he asked the chiefs to select a flag. And to make their task easier, he said, would you like to select this flag? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the chief said, well, we, uh, we like the colours. Uh, we'll go with it. So this became, uh, and you'll recognise it, of course, is the cross of St. George in the middle, which, which was very much part of the, the British naval tradition. And a small uh, on sign uh, in the uh, corner uh, he, saw, he looked up and saw the Southern Cross and put four stars in there, and that became the flag that was to distinguish New Zealand as a modern nation. Remember, this is an important event. It's the first time anyone has considered New Zealand as a nation. 
and Busby's doing it by suggesting a flag as a symbol of nationhood. So the chiefs then uh, agreed that this would be the flag, and ships that were built in New Zealand sailed with this flag. It was never our official flag. It, it, was, uh, it later became the flag of the um, Shore Savile fishing, uh, shipping line. It was their flag. They, they, uh, they liked the design too and took it away uh, years to come. We didn't have the current flag of New Zealand until the 1860s. That's when our, our official flag came. But this was the unofficial flag. The significance of it was it was the first act of nationhood that would distinguish New Zealand as a modern state. So Busby was uh, quite pleased that he had managed to persuade 34 chiefs to agree on a flag. It, it was, I understand, the only option put to them. <laughs> but the next year he called the chiefs together again, a, a similar, the same chiefs, virtually one or two more, and uh, invited them to sign a document. And the document was called the Declaration of Independence. And this was signed in 1835. Now, uh, the Declaration was a simple document, uh, but what it, uh, it made four very important points. And the first point it made was that New Zealand was independent. It wasn't part of Great Britain, it wasn't part of America, it wasn't part of France, and especially it wasn't part of New South Wales. Okay, so that's the first point he makes. New Zealand's independent. The second point that he made was that the sovereignty of New Zealand lies with the chiefs who represent their tribes. In 1835, this was a radical statement because in those days, the colonising powers whether they be France or Spain or Great Britain, tended not to recognise indigenous people as having sovereignty. The old way of colonising a country was that you walked into a country, put up your flag and proclaimed sovereignty. Now here's Busby taking quite a radical approach for his time by saying that uh, in New Zealand, the sovereignty lies with the indigenous people, with Māori. A radical statement in its time. He was ahead of his time, Busby. Although Britain's views on indigenous people was beginning to change, and this was part of the change. The third point he made in the declaration was that every year the chiefs will meet together to pass laws. He was prescribing a Māori parliament made up of the chiefs of New Zealand. And when I said earlier on that one option for New Zealand's development was as a Māori nation, this is where it came from. Busby had prescribed a Māori parliament, the chiefs would run the country, pass the laws, make the regulations, and he then prescribed a role for Britain, which was to act as a protector. Not to take it over, but to work alongside the chiefs to help them in international affairs principally, but also to help them with the administration of the country. So this then was the, the first uh, prescription for New Zealand's future, an independent state, its own parliament made up of the chiefs who were the sovereigns of the country, and Britain would act to help it. Now, uh, most, uh, very few people signed this, uh, 35, 36 chiefs signed it. Most tribes didn't know it existed uh, and maybe didn't worry too much. But it was sent to London, to the colonial office. The colonial office recognised it. The parliament in Britain recognised it for what it said. And the king of England, who was then William IV, he was the uncle to Queen Victoria, and he died a couple of years after this, and Queen Victoria succeeded him, King William sent back a letter saying that Britain is pleased to act as a protector of this infant state and recognises the sovereignty of the chiefs. So quite a major statement from Britain. Britain trying to make up for its bad record of colonisation in the past. It was trying to turn things around a bit and to begin to have a more understanding attitude to native peoples. 
So the importance of this then is that even though it was signed by relatively few chiefs, 35, it's hard to know how many chiefs there were then. Uh, we know now there are how many chiefs there are. There's uh, half a million. <laughs> but um, but uh, probably, if you judge by the number of chiefs who signed the treaty, there probably were uh, 600 people who would have been regarded as chiefs. 35 signed the Declaration of Independence. So you, wouldn't, you couldn't say it was sort of a unanimous decision. Britain didn't know that. So Britain accepted it for what it said, recognised Maori sovereignty, and then Britain's then approach to the treaty is, well, we'll work with this, uh, these, uh, these people to help them get going, to look after them internationally, to help them with their trading arrangements, and to do what we can to support them. Well, of course, it never happened. The, the Congress, the Parliament that Busby prescribed, never actually met. Uh, and in the end, Britain didn't act as a protector, but it took over the sovereignty. Now, one of the questions comes up, why did, uh, why did um, Busby write this? What was behind it? What was his motivation? And there are two uh, theories about it. One, one is that, uh, it's probably not the right one, but Busby had a, um, an assistant, a man called Mac Donnell, and Mac Donnell worked further north than Busby did. And uh, Mac Donnell had a great uh, belief that you could trace all the evils of the modern world to two things. One was whiskey and the other was rum. <laughs> and he passed a law which said that north of what is now Kawakawa, there will be no rum and no whiskey. I take it that beer was all right, wine was okay, sherry was fine, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no rum or whiskey. Now, uh, when Busby heard about it, he was extremely annoyed, not because he disagreed with the sentiments, but because who was MacDonnell to pass a law? And MacDonnell had no authority. Britain had no authority to pass laws in New Zealand, and yet here was his, his 2IC, his second in command, passing a law. So instead of sending him a memo which said, uh, Mr. MacDonnell, you've exceeded your brief, next time you do it, you've lost your job, some people say he constructed the Declaration of Independence as a very elaborate way of pointing out to MacDonnell that no one has the right to pass laws in New Zealand except the chiefs, because they have the sovereignty. Well, that's one possibility. It, it seems uh, an elaborate way of telling your uh, offsider that he's made a mistake. But the other reason may have had to do with a Frenchman called uh, Baron de Thierry. Are any of you descended from the Baron? Because, well, he travelled widely. <laughs> both, uh, both within New Zealand and within the Pacific. Uh, the, uh, he was a, uh, an entrepreneurial sort of guy, and uh, he knew he was important but he couldn't find anyone else to recognise that. <laughs> so he, uh, he gave himself the title of Baron, and he came down to the Pacific in search of a kingdom. He had the credentials, he was a king, all he needed was a kingdom. And uh, he, uh, he went to Samoa and was asked uh, to continue his voyage. <laughs> Went to Tahiti, of course, where France was quite well established, and uh, the French authorities said to him, you're just stirring up mischief. Went to Tonga and proposed that he might become the king, and they said, oh, thank you, but we already have one, <laughs> and came to New Zealand. And he had let, a, uh, let it be known, and Busby intercepted the message, that he had purchased 400,000 acres of land in the Hokianga Harbour area, and he was coming to establish the kingdom of Hokianga, and he was to become emperor. <laughs> now, it, was, it sounds fanciful, but uh, Busby was concerned. Uh, Busby was worried that this was absolutely contradictory to his understandings of who were the sovereigns of New Zealand. And so the other reason for the Declaration of Independence was to make it clear to the world, make it clear to the world 
that New Zealand has already got its sovereigns, and that is the chiefs of the tribes. And that's, that was the effect of this, that it went to the colonial office, the colonial office formally recognised Māori sovereignty and published this on the, what was called the London Gazette, which, uh, which went around the world, so that the world knew at that point that uh, this was Britain's position towards New Zealand and therefore it ought to be an international position. In other words, hands off. Uh, don't come there and become the king. The kings are already there. We don't know uh, of all these reasons why Busby did it, except that Busby was quite a bit ahead of his time in writing this document. Had he not written it, then Britain may never have needed a treaty. Because the treaty was one way of getting Māori sovereignty. They may not have needed it if they had not already recognised Māori sovereignty. But by recognising the Declaration of Independence, Britain said, yes, we recognise that the chiefs have sovereignty over their own country. Well, uh, of course, as I said, that's never happened. Uh, and instead, another option became uh, a popular one. Britain was, uh, in the 1830s, sitting on the fence a bit. Uh, it didn't want to do too much in New Zealand. Uh, quite expensive to colonise New Zealand. They'd had a bad experience with the United States a, uh, a quarter century or so before, uh, where they'd lost the colony, and that had been costly. And they weren't that keen to come to New Zealand, spend a lot of money, and have another colony that might go bad. So they were sitting on the fence. And this uh, declaration suited them quite nicely. They, they could uh, be involved in New Zealand, but not have to spend a huge amount of money on it. In 18... Uh, well, it, it all would have gone uh, like that, I suspect, were it not for another company Oh, I just mentioned the, uh, the missionaries here because uh, if you think that um, the treaty was about Māori and Pākehā relationships, it was also about Catholics and Protestants. And a huge part of the treaty uh, background can be attributed to the missionaries who arrived here. The first missionaries here were the Church Missionary Society, that's the Church of England, uh, in the person of uh, Samuel Marsden, who uh, had the unfortunate job of being the, the uh, chaplain to the prison colonies in New South Wales. And he found that a somewhat uh, unrewarding job, thought that he needed uh, a Christmas holiday, and came to New Zealand in 1814 <laughs> uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, got here, uh, took the first uh, Christian service, as, as, as far as we can uh, gather, on Christmas Day in 1814. Then realised that there were no missionaries here and so he established the first mission station. He had brought with him a, uh, an, another clergyman from the Church Missionary Society. Uh, they had intended to go back but uh, Marsden said to this uh, unsuspecting missionary, you had better stay here. <laughs> and so that's how the first mission station was established here. It was the only one and the Church of Missionary Society, which also had tentacles all around the world, uh, had t began to take a hold in New Zealand, and so that the Anglican faith was the first one promoted here. The Church of England uh, missionaries, the uh, Church of Missionary Society, had, had a relatively easy job. Uh, if, if you can use the business analogy, they had the whole share of the market. <laughs> there were no competitors, so that... Uh, uh, th their business was uh, saving souls and uh, they had no competition until the Methodists arrived and the Methodists came shortly afterwards but that wasn't a huge problem because they were Protestants and the Anglicans after all regarded them as an offshoot of the Anglican Church so that was tolerated but the real concern came when Bishop Pompalia established a Catholic mission station here and the old antagonisms between Protestants and Catholics, which were alive and well in Europe, uh, were transported to New Zealand. So that the, uh, the Church Missionary Society and missionaries uh, began to put pressure on Britain to get more involved in New Zealand, realising that if Britain got involved, then the stamp of the Church of England 
was also applied to New Zealand. Remember, Queen Victoria was the head of state and the defender of the faith. So the, the missionaries uh, began to uh, encourage the chiefs to encourage Britain to be more active in New Zealand. And every time a French warship appeared off the coast, there was this terrible fear from the mission stations that the Pope might be on board. <laughs> so there was this background then of, uh, of growing tension between the faiths uh, that were beginning to appear in New Zealand. Māori were uh, rapidly converting to Christian values and to Christian beliefs uh, and uh, there was beginning to be competition between the denominations. So the, the Church of England missionaries then, quite influential in the colonial office, send the message back to London, uh, get a bit more involved in New Zealand. Now the uh, uh, Britain sitting on the fence, but uh, Britain began to change its attitude in uh, 1838, 1839, and it had to do with another company that appeared called the New Zealand Company. Sometimes it's called the New Zealand Association, New Zealand Land Company, it's got various names. This had been a, a group that uh, arose first of all in the 1820s. They were uh, prominent uh, philanthropists in, uh, in England who wanted to help the poor people of Great Britain, principally Liverpool. In those days if you were poor in Liverpool, you were really poor and could not move out of that class. And here was a chance, they argued, for them to come to New Zealand, buy a little bit of land and establish a new way of life. It was an escape from the drudgery of Liverpool. And the idea of the company, the association, it was a not-for-profit organisation, it was a charitable organisation, and it would uh, help immigrants come to New Zealand, it would help purchase land here, and help them get established into a new way of life. Well, it fizzled out. It didn't come to anything. If you, if you want to uh, be really charitable, apparently you, you do need some money, and they didn't have any money. They had a great deal of goodwill, but, uh, but didn't have the money. So it didn't go anywhere until 1838, when it came out under new management. And the new manager was a man called Edward Gibbon Wakefield, and his approach to it was quite different. He no longer was talking about a charitable institution, but he was seeing this as a profit-making opportunity. So when the, when the company re-emerged in 1838, it was no longer based on helping the poor, but on making a profit. Uh, Edward Gibbon Wakefield had thought this through very carefully, and he had, reason, he had the opportunity to think it through very carefully, because for the three years prior to this, he had been in jail. <laughs> with very little to do but read about New Zealand. And he was an interesting man. He, uh, you may find yourself in, the, in this description, I hope not. But he, uh, he believed that it should be possible to get rich without working. <laughs> and uh, he, he wasn't a wealthy, he, wasn't, he was from a, a reasonably well-off but not a wealthy family of Britain. And uh, if you weren't wealthy in Britain, you probably had to work to get wealthier. But he and his brother thought there was a terrible injustice about this, that they were born slightly on the wrong side of the tracks, didn't believe they ought to work to get rich. And they hit on a scheme that uh, would give them wealth without working. I, I don't know any of you have tried it, but it was that if you, if you, uh, if you want to get rich quickly, and you don't want to work, then marry someone who's got some money. <laughs> and uh, they did it uh, together. Uh, Edward Gibbon Wakefield was a little more handsome than his brother Jermingham and said to be so a little more romantic. And so uh, he went through with a marriage to a very wealthy woman. Uh, the three of them went to, f to uh, the Riviera in France. The brother, of course, was the manager of the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the wife died under mysterious circumstances two years later. No one, no one ever knew the cause of death. And they squandered her money. 
didn't, didn't know how to manage the money. Came back to London and said, well, it worked once, let's have another go. By now, the criteria were a little more clearer in their minds, that, and I'll just pass it on to you in, in case uh, <laughs> you want to follow the advice. If you, uh, if you want to marry for money, what you do is you find someone who's an only child. You don't want to share the family fortune with a whole lot of brothers and sisters. You find someone whose parents are a bit older so that you don't have to wait too long to inherit the whole estate. And you find someone who doesn't know her own mind. And they found the perfect person, a 17-year-old uh, uh, girl who, who was an only child, her parents were older, didn't know her own mind, and they took her to France. Sent back a letter to the parents saying that if you don't make over a marriage contract and a marriage dowry, your daughter will be permanently shamed. That was in the days when you could actually shame people. <laughs> I, I, uh, I suspect now that uh, if fathers receive that letter, they may not be too worried. <laughs> but then, of course, it was, it was an absolutely terrible thing to be living in sin. And this was a prominent English family, and the thought of their daughter uh, being shamed was too much. So they actually uh, had good contacts with the French police. The French police picked up the Wakefields. They both went on trial. Edward Gibbon Wakefield went to jail. While he was in jail, he began to change tactics. He still was interested in not working too much, but realised that uh, he might have to work a little. Began to read about New Zealand and the New Zealand company that uh, didn't come to anything in 1820, and hit on the idea that the other way of making a fortune quickly and working a little bit was to come to New Zealand, buy it cheaply, and sell it at a profit. And that was basically the intention of the company. They had heard there was a lot of land in New Zealand that was there for the asking. You could pick it up for next to nothing and you could sell it to immigrants from Britain and make a huge profit. So he reformed the company, when he got out of jail, he reformed the company, had good contacts and uh, got a few uh, business people behind him, went to the government and said, uh, we hear you're interested in uh, going to New Zealand. Give us a charter. We'll provide all of the transport. We'll handle the purchasing of land on your behalf, and we'll take the profit. And the British government said, that's fine by us. And they wrote out a charter for the New Zealand company, which gave them that right. At the bottom of the charter, they had a little clause which said, we want some money up front for the goodwill. Now the New Zealand Land Company uh, didn't like that. They, uh, they said, well, why should we pay the British government anything? Then realised that they didn't need the government and formed the view in 1839 that they would just come to New Zealand, start buying land, and if the question of ownership and governance came up, they would simply establish a republic. So the, uh, the cowboys then were, uh, were launched and were coming to New Zealand, whether the government approved or not. They were coming without the government's blessing, and if they had to form a republic, that's what they would do. So remember at the beginning I said New Zealand had two options for development. There was the Maori Nation, Declaration of Independence, and here was the other option, that a sort of republic would just spring up as more settlers arrived. Well, the British government was extremely annoyed about this. They felt that in recognising the Declaration of Independence, they had also promised to protect Maori interests. And here was a group of British subjects coming to New Zealand to do the opposite, to buy the land as cheaply as possible. So the government within was, uh, the British government was worried about what was happening and realised that it had contributed to this situation decided then, in 1839, uh, that they would also, the government would also come to New Zealand and intervene in a much more active way than just sitting on the fence, which it was tending to do. They decided also that they would appoint a consul to New Zealand who would come over and negotiate a treaty with the chiefs. The purpose of the treaty was to negotiate a deal where the sovereignty that the chiefs had would be passed to the Crown, the British government, 
so that the British government could then protect them. Britain argued this way, if we can establish British law in New Zealand, we will be able to protect Maori interests. If there's no law there, we can't do anything about it. So it was sort of, you give us your sovereignty so that we can protect you. And Hobson was appointed to that task. Hobson uh, it was at a disadvantage. The, the, uh, the New Zealand Land Company left England in August 1839. Hobson uh, didn't get underway till October. There was a race, as it were, for, the, for New Zealand. Uh, Hobson was delayed. His, his wife had their fourth baby on the way over. And when she got to Sydney, uh, she said, uh, enough's enough. I uh, want to pick up a bit of uh, napsan and other things that are needed. And so uh, she insisted on a break in New South Wales, and they spent three weeks there. Quite, quite an important three weeks, because uh, Hobson went to an auction while he was in Sydney and discovered that what was being auctioned was thousands and thousands of New Zealand acres. No one knew who owned the land, but it was being auctioned in Sydney, and people who purchased it would have the, uh, the uh, belief that it was to be their land. So he realised that he ought to start moving quickly, otherwise there'd be nothing left. What with the New Zealand Land Company purchasing land, this, uh, these uh, sharks trading land in New South Wales, so he uh, had a discussion with the Governor of New South Wales. The Governor immediately promoted him to Lieutenant Governor of New Zealand. That was a premature promotion because you can't be Lieutenant Governor over something you don't own. But obviously Hobson had presumed that the Chiefs would agree to the deal. Uh, he then came to New Zealand in the uh, period of, in January of 1840 arrived here the last week of January, had an argument with the captain of the ship on his way out. The captain wouldn't recognise him as Lieutenant Governor, he would only recognise him as a consul. He thought that all of this was being rushed and that by rushing it, Hobson was uh, bending the law a little and so Captain Nias on the boat never recognised Hobson as Lieutenant Governor. When they arrived at uh, the Bay of Islands, the ship anchored, the tradition then was that uh, because the Queen's representative was on board, you fire a salute, so many guns. And when they got to 11 guns, which is what a consul gets, uh, the captain ordered his men to stop firing. Hobson in demanded that they carry on firing till they hit 15 guns, which is what a lieutenant governor gets. A governor would get 21 guns. So uh, when Hobson ordered his men to keep firing, the captain then said to the men, I'm the captain of the ship. Hobson may have a higher rank. I'm the captain of the ship. If you fire one more shot, you'll be charged with mutiny. And the men thought it over and said, I think we'll leave it at 11. <laughs> but it was uh, an indication of Nias's, the captain's concern about the haste of all of this and his, his uh, concern that Hobson was uh, just pushing it a bit too quickly and wasn't observing the correct conventions. Anyway, they, uh, they, they got here and uh, Hobson immediately uh, made contact with uh, a uh, William Colenso, who operated the first printing press in New Zealand and who was attached to one of the Church Missionary Society uh, mission stations. And he asked Colenso to get out a, a fax to all the tribes, advising them that a meeting was to be held on the 5th of February to meet Captain Hobson and to talk about a treaty. Now, Colenso got that out. It only went to the northern, a notice went to the northern tribes. It didn't go beyond that. Uh, and then... Uh, then Hobson realised that uh, he had invited these people to come and talk about a treaty. He'd better write one. He didn't, there was no treaty at that point. So on the 2nd of February, he began writing the treaty. Uh, sent the first draft over to Busby. Busby had a look at it, made some corrections, added Article 2, sent it back to Hobson. Hobson had a headache. He gave it to his secretary, a man called Freeman, and Freeman tidied it up. 
So those three men, uh, Hobson, Busby, and Freeman, wrote the treaty in two days. If you're working on an international treaty, uh, that probably is just a little bit too hasty to put it all together. Anyway, uh, it, it wasn't from scratch. Busby had, uh, had had some good instructions earlier on. Uh, sorry, Hobson had had some instructions earlier on. Anyway, at 4 o'clock on the 4th of February, the treaty uh, had been written. And uh, just as well, because some 800 uh, tribes, not, not 800 people, had arrived or were arriving to talk about it. So Hobson was quite pleased that he had got it done in such a short time. And he could see the smoke going up on the shore as the people were gathering and cooking meals. There were a whole lot of canoes coming in with, with uh, large numbers of people on them for the discussion. Some of them were, were curious about Hobson's ship, so they came quite close to it. And uh, Hobson was fascinated by them and, and uh, leaned over and he could hear them chanting as they uh, were going, making progress towards the shore. And then he realised that they weren't chanting in English. <laughs> they, were, they, were, uh, they were chanting in a language he didn't understand. And uh, in this rather late hour, wondered whether they would ever understand the English version of the treaty that he had just written, and figured that they probably wouldn't. So at four o'clock that afternoon, he sent the document over to Henry Williams, one of the missionaries, and asked him to translate it and have it ready for the meeting the next morning. Now, Williams was rushed. Uh, he said yes, he could probably do it. He would have liked to have given it a bit more thought, but he'd have a go at doing it. But he did it so badly that you and I have to have this meeting today because, <laughs> because uh, what, he, what he translated was a document that was in opposition to the one that Hobson had drafted. It wasn't just a minor mistake. There was a major error in it. Hobson had no way of knowing that, of course, uh, and he thanked Williams profusely for, <laughs> for, uh, for translating it. Nine o'clock the next morning, the meeting got underway, the 5th of February, and uh, a very formal occasion. The, the naval officers were dressed in full naval uniform. There were flags flying on this big marquee that had been erected. Hobson looked resplendent in uh, the, the, uh, the uniform of a consul. Captain Nias was there with a sword uh, on, at his side, so it was quite a spectacular event. 800 uh, people there at the meeting, not all of them in the marquee, <laughs> some waiting outside. About 200 settlers were there. The, uh, the, the church missionaries were there in large numbers. So it was, it was quite a major event that uh, was proposed, that, that was happening. Uh, Hobson uh, had a table in the front and he asked Williams to translate for him. The settlers, there were about 200 of them at the meeting, were opposed to that. They didn't think that Williams was a very good translator and thought that he might deliberately skew things. The settlers, by the way, were against the treaty because uh, they realised that uh, once this treaty was signed, the laws of England would apply, and that's why they'd come 12,000 miles to get away from the laws of England. So they, they weren't too happy. They also knew they wouldn't be able to buy land directly. They'd have to go through the Crown. So the settlers were by and large unhappy about it, and they said, we don't want Williams translating it, we'll, we've got our own translator. And so they put up uh, one of their own to act as the official translator. But he was drunk and he fell down <laughs> and uh, wasn't able to do the job. So Williams carried on, um, yeah, too much whiskey and rum, but Williams, <laughs> Williams carried on uh, as the translator. And, and the discussion got underway and uh, Williams read out, introduced Hobson, read out the Maori version said uh, the discussion was mainly about land. The key issue of the treaty wasn't land, it was sovereignty. That wasn't actually discussed. The issue was land. Um, the chiefs, by and large, were opposed to it. They got up one by one in, in very direct language, although it seems that Williams didn't translate it directly, but they would say to Hobson, go home. 
and take four eyes with you, karu fa. Uh, Williams was a curiosity because he wore glasses, and they used to call him karu fa, four, four eyes. So they'd say uh, in Bari, and Colenso did all the recording, they'd say in Bari, uh, go home, uh, Hobson, and take karu fa with you. Uh, apparently Williams bended the translation a little, <laughs> said they have one or two reservations, sir. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that's how the discussion went, uh, and it looked as if there would be no interest in a treaty, until right at the end of the day, three chiefs who were from mission stations and were quite uh, influential chiefs uh, stood up and put their view. Their view was that uh, times have changed so much that uh, the tribes need Britain to go into the new world. They trust Britain. If it's an option between Britain, France, and America, all of whom had some sort of interest in New Zealand, they thought that Britain might take them the furthest, and they suggested that the treaty should be signed. But there was no agreement. And uh, in the afternoon, uh, as the day wore on, Hobson was astute enough to realise that uh, the tribes didn't agree, that they hadn't reached a conclusion, and he said the meeting will come to an end and we'll continue it, not tomorrow, but we'll continue it on the 7th of February. Of course, the 6th was a holiday, it was Waitangi Day. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, his, uh, his view was that if you have a day off, if everyone has a day off, they'll be able to think about it a bit more and come back and discuss it again on the 7th. So he retired to his ship and so did his people, uh, uh, the tribes, the missionaries, and the settlers continued discussing it. So that uh, they were, their discussions went on well into the night. The missionaries were lobbying the chiefs to say, we think you ought to sign this. Uh, they had their own reasons for that. The settlers were lobbying the chiefs saying, we don't think you ought to sign this, and they had their reasons for that. And come the morning, the 6th of February, the chief said, well, why wait a day? Let, let's get on with it. We, we, uh, we want to talk about it more. We want to continue the meeting today. Don't need a day off. So they decided to have the meeting on the 6th of February, but forgot to tell Hobson. And uh, Hobson was fairly annoyed about that because he was his first uh, instruction as consul to New Zealand, and the New Zealanders had completely disregarded it. So he, when he came over, he came over in dressed only partly in naval uniform and partly in civil uniform. And the reason for doing it was to point out that this wasn't a proper, proper meeting. He had said the 7th, everyone else had said the 6th, so he only half recognised it as a formal meeting. They were about to get underway when who should turn up but the Roman Catholic bishop, Bishop Pompalio. You may have noticed, you may have heard that earlier this year his remains were returned to New Zealand uh, for interment here. He had been buried in France, but they, because of the role he played, people wanted him back. So the bishop turns up, uh, flowing robes, purple robes, and uh, has a look around at the proceedings and then says to Hobson that he suspects this whole thing is a Church of England jack up. <laughs> And uh, he wanted to add something else to the treaty. And what he wanted added was that everyone in New Zealand should be free to choose their own religion. And Maori custom should be respected. Now, sometimes that's called the fourth article of the treaty. Sometimes it's called the protocol clause. But uh, it was read out at Waitangi, but never written into the treaty. So the, uh, the bishop then, the bishop Pompali, just a little concerned, again about the same point that Nias was concerned, there's, there's an element of rush in all of this. So Hobson agreed to that, he agreed to the protocol clause, and then said, let's get on with it, and, and uh, as he was about to get on with it, he then said, no more discussion, because this isn't a proper meeting, the only thing you can do today is sign the treaty. I won't allow any discussion on it. Now, I've been at a number of meetings where the chairman has exercised the chairman's right, <laughs> but this seemed to be just a little unusual and a little hard to follow, that Hobson uh, denied any discussion and simply said, come and sign the treaty. 
when he said that, Colenso, who was faithfully recording everything, uh, confronted Hobson and said, uh, the people you're asking to sign this treaty have no idea what the treaty's about. Uh, Hobson, uh, Colenso knew that the big issues hadn't even been talked about. Uh, land wasn't the main issue, sovereignty was the issue, never, never raised. Uh, Hobson's reply to him was uh, that if they don't understand what they're about to sign, it will be your job in future years to make it clear to them. So he passed that over to the church, that the church had an obligation to explain the treaty. Uh, and then he got underway. Hobson was increasingly irritated. He had high blood pressure, at least that's my guess. Be well, he, uh, he had a stroke in March, um, a minor stroke, and then he died in 1842 at quite a young age, and I suspect he had had a cerebral hemorrhage then, so, and he used to complain of headaches all the time. So I suspect he had high blood pressure, and he was irritable. So uh, once he had put Colenso in his place and said, uh, your job is to tell people in years to come the meaning of what they've just signed, he then invited the chiefs to come and sign the treaty. And the first three up were the three that had agreed the night before, and they stepped forward and signed. As each one signed, he shook their hand, said, he iwi kotahi tato, we are one people, gave them two blankets and a small quantity of tobacco, to make sure they didn't live too long. <laughs> <laughs> then... Um, uh, then this, uh, this thing called whanaungatanga took over. Whanaungatanga is a process which uh, basically means that uh, if your uncle or auntie tell you to do something and you want to keep uh, uh, reasonably healthy, you'll probably say, yes, uncle, <laughs> or yes, auntie. And so these three chiefs that came up and signed were very influential. All they needed to do was to nod under the direction of their nephew or to nod in the direction of a cousin and that uh, nephew or cousin knew that they would have to come up and sign the treaty. If, if you're dealing with the, the tribes, you, you, you need to, to link into this whanaungatanga pretty well and make sure you find out who auntie is so <laughs> and get her on your side. <laughs> Otherwise, you're in trouble. <laughs> so uh, the three um, gradually people came up and signed. At the end of the day, there were 46 people who had signed, and Hobson thought, well, that's not too bad. Called it a day. So uh, they were going to have some celebrations the next day on the 7th of, uh, 7th of February, but it rained, and they had to cancel them. And on the 8th, they actually had the celebrations, but by then everyone had gone home. So they simply fired a few rockets up from the, from the ship, uh, to mark the first uh, Waitangi celebration. They've had trouble at Waitangi ever since then, uh, getting the, the format right for the celebrations. <laughs> but um, it, it sort of fizzled out a little bit there. But what happened then was that the treaty was taken to 43 other places in the country and signed there. So the signing didn't actually finish till September. Taken all around the country. The missionaries took it. Uh, quite a lot of them, and some uh, uh, government officials took it, and they travelled the whole country uh, with the Treaty of Waitangi. They didn't go everywhere. They, they, uh, some tribes were missed out. Uh, Rangitane and Palmerston North and the Manawatu were missed out. They were never asked, do you want to sign the treaty or not? Uh, the man who was taking it down there was Henry Williams, and he was travelling on the coast, and he left a note in his diary to say he stopped at the mouth of the Manawatu River, but no one was home. The problem was home was 30 miles up the river. <laughs> and so Rangitani were never invited to sign it. The Tuhoi tribe in the Uruweras never signed the treaty. Not that they opposed it, but no, they missed the turnoff, I suspect, when they were, uh, <laughs> were travelling into the Bay of Plenty. Some tribes uh, refused to sign. Uh, the two big tribes in the middle of the North Island, that's the Te Arawa tribe at Rotorua and the Tu Tor tribe around Lake Taupo, wouldn't sign. And when the missionary came there, they had a couple of objections. One was that uh, if this is so important, and if this is a treaty between the tribes and the Queen of England, where's the Queen? They don't send third-level management to talk to me. <laughs> I'm a chief. I want to talk to the other chief. 
And so they, wouldn't, uh, they didn't like the, the style. Uh, they, they felt there was a lack of respect there. The other problem that Tu Whare Tor had was that it was a queen and not a king. They would have been much more comfortable doing business with a king. I think they still have that inclination to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> and so do their cousins in Te Arawa. <laughs> well, because Tu Whare Tor wouldn't sign, their cousins Te Arawa said, we won't sign either. So here you've got two large groups, asset-rich tribes, not signing. Some tribes signed in a conditional way, and today we would say they'd signed a memorandum of understanding. Uh, well, the, the, the Waikato tribe from here, for example, the paramount chief Te Whero Whero, who became the first Maori king, refused to sign the treaty. But he thought, let's well, say there's something in it and we miss out. <laughs> So uh, he had no objection to 39 other chiefs signing it at Port Waikato. His argument was, if we sign it, we're saying we're interested, but if I withhold my signature, we're not totally committed. It's today we would call that an expression of interest, <laughs> that you're, you want to be involved in it, but you're not ready to make an absolute commitment to it. It was so subtle that it was lost on the British. <laughs> but... But, of course, within Maori politics, it, it, it meant a huge thing, but the paramount chief had not signed it. On the East Coast, there was another paramount chief, Te Kanea Takiro, took the same approach. He said to uh, William Williams, who was the missionary who took it there, brother to Henry Williams, and the father of uh, his daughter married Busby, but I, I won't go into the, uh, <laughs> the domestics of all of this, the, uh, when Will William Williams took the treaty to the East Coast, to Kanea Takiro said, come to my house and sign it. I won't sign it myself if you don't mind, <laughs> but the others will sign it. Now, he had the same belief that by not signing it, he was protecting his tribe in case it went wrong. And today we would say he was uh, interested in discussing it further, <laughs> but not ready to make an absolute commitment. Uh, one of our people signed it twice, uh, Te Raupraha. You may have heard of him. He, he was uh, quite good with a gun. And uh, it was always better to be on his side than on the other side. So when Henry Williams went to Wellington, he made a straight line for Te uh, and Te agreed to sign the treaty. And then the man who did the South Island, when he came back from the South Island, uh, he approached Te as well and asked him to sign it. Te said, you know, I'm sure I've signed this jolly thing before, but signed it anyway. Uh, some of our uh, relatives say that he really only wanted the four blankets. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, he, he, uh, his name appears twice. Uh, five women signed it, uh, only five. Uh, the missionaries who took it round, as women came up to sign, were discouraged because in Britain at that time, women were chattels of their husband and didn't sign important things like a Treaty of Waitangi. So the, the, he would discourage women. One or two broke through. Uh, Tarawpraha's sister, for example, signed the treaty. Uh, she's, she was actually the mastermind of his whole operation. This was uh, managed the whole campaign. An extremely uh, strategic uh, thinker, a great mind, a powerful woman, and a smart woman. She uh, would send him out with the guns. <laughs> <laughs> tell him where to go, and he, she would stay at home. <laughs> but she signed it, and so did four other women. And at the end of the day, at the end of September, there were something like 510 signatures. Now, uh, Hobson rushed it all. Here was a process that was taking its time, but proceeding with some sort of logic, even though it was a little bit uh, hit and miss as to who signed it. Hobson uh, rushed it. He, um, on the May the 21st of 1840, he proclaimed sovereignty over New Zealand. Remember, the treaty wasn't signed until September. On May the 21st, he proclaimed sovereignty over the whole of New Zealand, and he said, I'm proclaiming sovereignty over the North Island because there is universal agreement with the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, that was a... a a fairly flawed statement. Uh, first of all, most tribes had not by then decided whether they wanted to sign it or not, and he ignored completely 
the opposition to it from the two big tribes in the centre of the island. And in the case of the South Island, he used a different approach to taking sovereignty. Is anyone here from Ngaitahu? Yeah, I might just have to reword this slightly. <laughs> well, perhaps not, because <laughs> what, he, what he wrote in his proclamation was that he's taking the North Island because there's universal agreement with the Treaty of Waitangi. That, that was a flawed statement. And I'm taking the South Island because the natives, by right of discovery, not through the treaty, but by right of discovery, because the natives of the South Island are not sufficiently intelligent to understand a treaty. <laughs> that was how he was wording it. Now, while he was doing that, his um, offsider, Major Bunbury, was in the South Island negotiating the treaty <laughs> with, the, with the people down there. And in fact, the South Island was taken twice, once by right of discovery, and then in June, Major Bunbury took sovereignty over the South Island on the basis of agreement with the Treaty of Waiting. So Hobson uh, rushed it a bit in May. The reason he rushed it, apparently, is that a French warship had arrived <coughs> in Auckland in April and was heading for the South Island, and the rumour was that France was going to take the South Island. There's no evidence for it, but that was the rumour and Hobson uh, wanted to rush it. The other thing that made him rush it was that one of his men went to Wellington and was kidnapped by the Wakefields. Well, he used the word kidnapped. It, it uh, may not have been quite like that. And while this person was in captivity, he claims that he overheard the New Zealand Land Company directors talking about establishing the Republic of Wellington. And uh, Hobson, uh, rightly or wrongly, thought that he had to act quickly to cut that off. So he rushed the gun a bit, uh, established the, uh, took sovereignty over New Zealand, sent the message to London, the, uh, the, the message arrived back. I'll just, um, just uh, rush through this because I think I've, he, um, put the message to London. The, the London Gazette published this message that Britain has taken sovereignty over New Zealand. The effect of that is saying to France, hands off New Zealand. America, hands off New Zealand. It's a British possession. Immediately, this is the dark chapter in New Zealand's history, we were governed from New South Wales. And, and, and the arrangements, uh, the only arrangements they could make was that New Zealand became a dependency of New South Wales and the governor of New South Wales was the governor of New Zealand. Hobson wasn't the first governor, the governor of New South Wales was. There's a Trivial Pursuits question in the New Zealand edition on that one. Everyone thinks it's Hobson. It's Governor Gyps, by the way. Anyway, uh, that only lasted until the following year. In 1841, New Zealand became a crown colony that is, it was governed by the British Parliament. In uh, 1854, we established our own parliament, so we became a self-governing colony, still pretty much under the direction of Great Britain. 1903, we became a dominion, no longer a colony. And in 1947-46, we, we accepted the Statute of Westminster, which gave us much more independence from Great Britain. And in 1986, but not until 1986, we became an independent country. So that, uh, and by independent, I mean it is now impossible for Great Britain to intervene in any New Zealand law or any New Zealand policies. Not that they want to. Their interests have switched entirely to Europe <laughs> and the European uh, community. <laughs> they won't take our lamb anymore. <laughs> They wouldn't defend us when France was letting bombs off on the uh, Mururoa Atoll. Remember, Great Britain would not come out and oppose that because in opposing it, they would have to criticise their neighbours, France, and they needed the French money, the French franc, more than they needed the New Zealand dollar. So Britain has increasingly moved away from New Zealand anyway, and in 1986, we passed in New Zealand a, an act of Parliament. Geoffrey Palmer put it through Parliament which now makes us an absolutely independent country, but still part of the British Commonwealth. When Queen Elizabeth comes here, she doesn't come here as the Queen of Great Britain. She comes here as the Queen of New Zealand. So she's our head of state. It's unusual that she lives 12,000 miles away. 
and New Zealand's probably the night job rather than the full-time job. <laughs> but uh, she, she doesn't come here as the Queen of England. She comes here as the Queen of New Zealand. So uh, our links with Britain are, are, are uh, strong. We, we retain the same monarch, even though she wears a different hat when she comes here. Retain the same monarch, but we are now an independent country. And then the question that we, we now uh, face is that this was our beginning. You can see how the significance of the treaty to the beginning of, uh, of New Zealand as a modern state. And the question ahead of us is uh, where now does the treaty uh, sit in the future development of New Zealand? I've rushed through this uh, period of our history. It's only a five-year period, and a huge amount was happening most of it, by the way, on the other side of the world. The tribes were by and large unaware of what was being planned for them. This was well before the Resource Management Act and the requirement to consult. <laughs> that, uh, that, that came much later. So all of this was sort of happening uh, around the tribes rather than uh, them having any direct input into it. But the net effect was that New Zealand emerged into the modern world as a... Uh, colony of Great Britain, and that's how we were born into uh, the international community. Not as a Maori nation, not as a republic. Interestingly enough, those two debates are still run from time to time. Ken Mayer, quite in favour of establishing the Maori nation, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister, quite in favour of a republic, <laughs> apparently. So we, we, we're obviously going to have these debates again, uh, but in 18, uh, between 1835 and 1840, they were quite major issues. Now, I thought uh, w we might just uh, have a break, not for lunch. Uh, it's a little early for lunch. But um, if we just have a break for a few minutes, because before lunch, I just want to uh, read the treaty through with you so that for once in your life you can say you've actually heard the treaty and know what the words are. Most people who are great commentators about the treaty have never actually read it. So, so why don't we break for a, a few minutes and then I'll do that, then we could uh, break for lunch. It was to try and get some agreement between the tribes, the settlers and the British Crown. And so the, uh, the treaty had the potential to be uh, something of a model for the way that a big superpower like Great Britain should relate to a small nation. And in doing that, the idea was that the interests of all three groups would be protected and that there would be a fair arrangement so that no one became disadvantaged as they interacted with each other. That was the intention. Now, uh, we, we talked quite a lot about the, um, how the treaty arose and its development. I, I just really wanted to... Um, read the treaty to you so that you can say that at least once in your life you've heard it and then talk just a little bit about the problem which I referred to earlier on of the uh, translating the two versions, what went wrong and then how we overcome that problem in New Zealand because there, there are ways of overcoming it without uh, arguing all the time. Now the, the treaty, very simple document, there's, there's five parts to it and it's short. By terms of an international treaty it's a short document uh, that tells you it wasn't written by a lawyer. It, <laughs> it was drafted by a naval captain who was a bit stretched to find the right words from time to time. But it's got a preamble, which is like the introduction, quite important because that sets out the objectives of the treaty. What is it that this is supposed to do? Then there's Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, and the postscript. Postscript is just the, uh, the end bit. So, uh, in terms of, uh, of a, a treaty of this, of the importance of the treaty, it's quite a brief document. So brief that it is really a guideline rather than a set of specific rules and regulations. And by the way, the treaty itself is not a legal document. It's an agreement between two groups. Sometimes it's confused. Uh, and people say, well, it's not legal, therefore it doesn't exist. It never was intended to be a legal document. It's an agreement between two groups. It's, 
Now, just the preamble, I'm going to read it through. Don't be, uh, you'll never read that from where you're sitting. Actually, I'll have trouble reading it from here. But the, uh, it's the longest sentence in New Zealand, as far as I know, because the uh, Hobson never put in any commas. Uh, and if you, uh, I'm going to just put the commas in as I go along. But uh, you, you can pick up as I'm reading it what it intended to do. It intended to protect Maori interests, and you'll see that come through. It intended to protect settlers who were already in New Zealand. There were 2,000 of them, and that, that's mentioned as we go through it. It's intended to be the background. Uh, it's intended that a treaty will be signed, and so that's spelled out here. It was intended to provide some way of governing the country, some way of getting law and order into the country so that the lawlessness that the settlers had been uh, demonstrating would come to an end. And it was uh, an opportunity for the chiefs to agree on signing a treaty. So all of those things you'll find probably as I read them through. Anyway, it says, Her Majesty Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, I'm putting the comma in, regarding with her royal favour the native chiefs and tribes of New Zealand and anxious to protect their just rights and property and to secure to them the enjoyment of peace and good order, has deemed it necessary in consequence of the great number of Her Majesty's subjects who have already settled in New Zealand, and there were about 2,000 uh, British subjects here then, and the rapid extension of emigration both from Europe and Australia, which is still in progress, to constitute and appoint a functionary properly authorised to treat with the Aborigines of New Zealand for the recognition of Her Majesty's sovereign authority over the whole or any part of those islands, Her Majesty therefore being desirous to establish a settled form of civil government with a view to avert the evil consequences which must result from the absence of necessary laws and institutions alike to the native population and to her subjects, has been graciously pleased to empower and to authorise me, William Hobson, a captain in Her Majesty's Royal Navy, consul and lieutenant governor of such parts of New Zealand as may be or hereafter shall be ceded to Her Majesty to invite the confederated and independent chiefs of New Zealand to concur in the following articles and conditions. So in using the language of the time, it says uh, in very broad terms the purpose of this document and now the chiefs are invited to agree with these three articles. So that's the preamble. Article one is quite brief. The chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand that's a reference to the chiefs who signed the Declaration of Independence. Remember, most chiefs didn't. There were only 35 or 36. So it says, the chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand and the separate and independent chiefs who have not become members of the Confederation, that was the majority, cede to Her Majesty, the Queen of England, absolutely and without reservation, all the rights and powers of sovereignty which the said confederation or individual chiefs respectively exercise or possess, or may be said to exercise or possess over their respective territories as the sole sovereigns thereof. The point of Article 1, it recognises Maori sovereignty and then invites the chiefs to give their sovereignty without any reservation to the Crown. Article 2, this is the one that uh, Busby has allegedly added, her Majesty the Queen of England confirms and guarantees to the chiefs and tribes of New Zealand and to the respective families and individuals thereof the full, exclusive and undisturbed possession of their lands and estates, forests, fisheries and other properties which they may individually possess so long as it is their wish and desire to retain the same in their possession. But the chiefs of the United Tribes and the individual chiefs yield to Her Majesty the exclusive right of preemption over such lands as the proprietors thereof may be disposed to alienate at such prices as may be agreed upon between the respective proprietors and the persons appointed by Her Majesty to treat with them in that behalf. Basically two parts to this article. The first part says 
whatever you own, we guarantee that you can keep it. So that the treaty is in no way to take away your rights. And we guarantee that, and it spells out certain things, lands, estates, forests, fisheries, and other properties. So the first part of Article 2 is a guarantee that your property will not be affected by this deal. The second part of it contradicts the first part just a little bit because it says uh, if you want to sell your land, you can, but you can only sell it to the Crown. You can't sell it to the person who offers you the best money. You can only sell it to the Crown. This was, of course, uh, one of Hobson's uh, ways of bringing under control the activities of the New Zealand Land Company. So the chiefs could not sell directly to uh, certain buyers. They had to sell to the crown. So that's Article 2. At Article 3, in consideration thereof, Her Majesty the Queen of England extends to the natives of New Zealand her royal protection and imparts to them all the rights and privileges of British subjects. Now, the, uh, the point of Article 3 is that this is addressed to Maori people as individuals, not to Maori people as members of tribes, and it gives them rights that they never had before, the rights of citizenship. That is, the right to a fair trial in a court, the right to hold a British passport. Actually, that might have been the end of it. The, uh, I don't think the DPB had come in then. And, uh, and the right to a free education wasn't there then. <laughs> So the uh, Article 3 then is about the rights that individual people will have. Article 2 is a guarantee to the tribes that tribal property will be protected. Article 1 is that the Crown will, ex will take sovereignty over New Zealand if you agree with it. Then the postscript. Uh, now we, therefore, the chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand, being assembled in Congress at Victoria in Waitangi, the name Victoria never took on, but it was proposed to call that place Victoria. And we, the separate and independent chiefs of New Zealand, claiming authority over the tribes and territories which are specified after our respective names, having been made fully to understand the provisions of the foregoing treaty, accept and enter into the, into the same in the full spirit and meaning thereof, in witness of which we have attached our signatures or marks at the places and the dates respectively specified, done at Waitangi the 6th day of February in the year of our Lord, 1840, and then the 512. Uh, only one signature, all the other people signed it with the mark of their tattoo, their moko, so that uh, they had a distinguishing moko and they'd put some part of the moko there, and the missionary would write the name alongside it. So it was clear who, uh, actually it was not very clear sometimes, but it, to indicate who that person was. And as I said earlier, this was taken all around the country, 43 different locations. And by so the, the first signing was on the 6th of February, but it wasn't completely signed until September. The postscript basically says we understand what we have signed, uh, which was probably fairly uh, unlikely. Now, I mentioned before that when, when Williams translated the, the treaty, he did it in a bit of a hurry, and there were some, some uh, significant inaccuracies in his translation, which altered the meaning. And... Uh, In Article 1, uh, this is the article, you'll remember, where the, uh, the Crown asks the chiefs to give the sovereignty, their sovereignty, to the Crown. Sovereignty in, in British thinking is an all-embracing term. Uh, sovereignty is absolute authority. Uh, the, the authority of the British monarch is said to come from God. And so the, uh, the Britain regards this as an absolute type of authority. America doesn't. America's views of sovereignty are a little bit different. In America, you can have shared sovereignty so that the Indian people, when they're on their reservation, retain an element of their sovereignty. As soon as they step off at the reservation, <laughs> they don't. But on the reservation, they have a, a residual sovereignty. Britain's approach is quite different. That It's an absolute thing. There's only one sovereign. As it happens in Britain, the sovereign has no power whatsoever. Uh, it's Parliament, really, that uh, is the, uh, has the sovereignty. But it's an absolute type of sovereignty. The Queen shares her sovereignty with no one. So it's a powerful statement. 
and uh, the significant translation is to do with this phrase, all the rights and powers of sovereignty, because that's what the chiefs are going to give to the crown. Now, when Williams translated it, he used the phrase kawanatanga katoa as an equivalent of all the rights and powers of sovereignty. Now, uh, kawanatanga is uh, a missionary word. It's not a Māori word. Uh, if you're translating from one language to another and you can't find the right word, you can either go for one that's pretty close in meaning or you can make up a new word. There were no sheep in New Zealand, you see, before the missionaries came, and so the word for sheep is hippie. Sounds like sheep. And the word for cow is ko. Sounds like cow. That's called a transliteration. And kawanatanga is on the same lines. It's a transliteration of the word governance. Kawana sounds like governor. And when they translated the Bible and got to Pontius Pilate, he was referred to as kawana, governor Pontius Pilate. So there would have been some familiarity with the word kawanatanga, but it is essentially to do with governance. Governance is not the same as sovereignty. And you remember in the Declaration of Independence, the idea was that Britain would act to protect Maori interests. The notion of governance would have been quite consistent with that. So uh, what Williams did by using the word kawanatanga, he took a word which is of lesser authority than the word sovereignty. So although the tribes, the chiefs were giving something, in, in the English version they were giving total sovereignty. In the Maori version they were giving the right to govern, which is something a bit less than what the English implies. The other problem comes in Article 2. And in this phrase, the full exclusive and undisturbed possession of their lands and estates and so on. Uh, the phrase uh, full exclusive and undisturbed possession is the important one. And that was translated by Williams as te tino rangatiratanga. Now, uh, te tino rangatiratanga is a very powerful phrase which doesn't just talk about possession but talks about absolute authority. So you've got this rather peculiar situation that in Article 2, the Māori version says to the chiefs, you can have absolute authority over your own affairs. And that contradicts the English version of Article 1, which says that the Crown has absolute authority. So there is a serious conflict there in meaning between the English and the Māori versions. And just, uh, there, there were other, other problems as well, but not, not nearly as significant as that. And I won't uh, go into all, uh, all of that. But you can see uh, that uh, we're left with uh, some problems. Most of those notes there are uh, designed for my uh, class at Massey University, and uh, they tend to fail if they don't know all those things. <laughs> but uh, you're not confronted with an exam, so I'm, I'm not... Uh... Now, the, the point is then we've got a treaty written in two languages that don't add up. Uh, the, the, Maori, the English version is absolutely clear, the sovereignty goes to the Crown, and the Crown will protect Māori property. The, the Māori version, uh, the chiefs give the right to govern to the Crown, which is something less than authority, but retain full authority over their own matters, their own affairs. So it's quite a difference in meaning. Now, how do we go? The good news is that um, we're not the only country in the world with, the, with this problem. In fact, wherever treaties have been signed, between a colonizing country and a colonized country, this problem has, arisen, has arisen. Whenever you've got treaties in two languages, you'll find the translations are often contradictory. So we're not on our own. And uh, <laughs> there has developed around the world ways of handling this problem. Uh, one way is that you, uh, you disregard one version entirely. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, the tendency in New Zealand in the early uh, colonial days was to only place emphasis on the English version because that's the one that Hobson signed. 
and he didn't really understand the Māori version and placed no emphasis, no importance on it. Most Māori claimants who go to the Waitangi Tribunal say, oh, we didn't sign the English version. Only 39 chiefs signed the English version, so we'll only look at the Māori version. Now, well, Tainui, of course, when they were going for the fishing thing, went for the English version, which they signed, because that spells out fisheries. The Māori version doesn't. <laughs> but uh, but, but um, uh, that, that aside, <laughs> this, uh, this approach doesn't take you anywhere except into an argument. So that you can say, well, your version's not the right one, ours is the right one, and you can argue that forever, but that argument sort of doesn't go anywhere. So it's not a very fruitful solution. What many countries overseas use is a rule they call the contra pro forentum rule. And uh, this rule basically says that if you've got a, a treaty written in two languages and there's a problem between them, you give priority to the version that's written in the language of the party that did not draw up the treaty. It presumes that if you didn't draw up the treaty, you were a passive partner then you're at a disadvantage. So that this is Lord McNair's rule, the contra pro forentum rule. Give priority to the treaty, to the version written in the language of the party that did not draw up the treaty. We don't practice this in New Zealand. This is not our approach, although it is an international approach and is favoured by many countries. New Zealand has its own way of doing it. It's the number eight wire approach. <laughs> which actually has been uh, noted around the world as quite an innovative approach. And many countries around the world are interested in how we do it because they think it takes us somewhere. What, uh, what we do is to recognise the method in, contained in the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975. This was the act uh, passed in the time of uh, Norman Kirk, sponsored by Matt Rata, the late Matt Rata, which established the Waitangi Tribunal. And in that act, the tribunal is given instructions about how it is to regard the treaty. And that's the approach that now is the dominant approach in New Zealand to reconciling these differences between the two versions. And I'll explain it. So it's quite, uh, quite simple. But the, um, no, the, what the act says is that the Waitangi Tribunal must have equal regard to both texts of the treaty. It, it can't say that one is more important than the other. They're both equally important. So that's, that's the first point it makes. The second point it makes is that if there's a problem, you should try and understand the, the, uh, the get the meaning by blending the texts. Now, actually, no one knows what that means, and it's never been done. So, <laughs> so this is, that's the unhelpful part of this act. But the third point that it makes is that to understand the full meaning of the treaty, you should examine the principles of the treaty as much as the words of the treaty. Try and go behind the words and the different versions and understand what are the underlying principles that the treaty stands for. And that's the approach that the Waitangi Tribunal uses, and that's the approach that is quite distinctive uh, to New Zealand and has attracted uh, a considerable amount of uh, attention. It's got some flaws because uh, who says what the principles are? Well, in this act, the Waitangi Tribunal is given the authority to say what the principles are, but just about everyone has a go at formulating their own principles. And the court has formulated principles, and the uh, Royal Commission on Social Policy formulated principles. And uh, the government, David Longley's government, one of the last things that David Longley did as Prime Minister before he and Margaret went overseas was to um, form, formulate a set of principles which became the, the government's principles. So that a lot of people have had to go at principles. Uh, some of them stand out more than others. So uh, I'll just... Uh, There are some principles that you see coming up all over again, over and over again, and uh, one is the principle of partnership. And that, uh, that has been emphasised in several Waitangi Tribunal reports, and it was a major principle uh, articulated by the Court of Appeal in 1987. So this notion of partnership is one principle. There are some problems with it as well. Who are the partners? 
and not always easy to tell who the partners are, the, the government has huge trouble finding out who the Māori partner is. They, they figure it might be a tribe. Is it a tribe? Is it all Māori people? If it's a tribe, who do you talk to? Because there's sometimes more than one voice within a tribe. <laughs> and the only thing the government can be sure about is that whoever they're talking to is the wrong person. <laughs> so the, 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 they, have, uh, they have quite a lot of trouble <laughs> locating the partner. <laughs> now, Māori have had the same trouble. Uh, in 1892, a uh, delegation set out from New Zealand to London, the, the, it led by King Tafio, second Māori king, and they were concerned about the disregard for the treaty. And so they said, well, we'll go and find our partner who we believe is the Crown. And we understand that the Crown's in London. So they went to London to find a partner to the Treaty of Waitangi. And they got to, uh, to see Queen Victoria, they got an audience with her, this was in 1892. And apparently she was very gracious to them and, and uh, gave them a cup of tea and then uh, explained that although she wore the crown, she wasn't actually the crown, <laughs> which was a little difficult for the chiefs to understand. And I'm sure if they had been alive much later, they would have described this as a type of Clayton's chief, <laughs> someone who looked like the real thing but really wasn't. Now, she said, I'm not the crown. My ministers are the people you should see. So she then arranged for this delegation of chiefs to meet the prime minister and the minister who had responsibility for colonial affairs. So they met these two people and, and they uh, were very good to them as well, but then explained that this was a long trip they had made, 12,000 miles, when they needed only to have made a trip of 300 miles because the crown is in Wellington, not in London. By then you see, New Zealand had become a self-governing colony, and from Britain's point of view, the authority of the Crown was now vested in the New Zealand Parliament. So the Chief said, but we've been there. <laughs> they didn't look like the Crown to us, and they didn't seem to act like the Crown. <laughs> but nonetheless, you should go back there. So they went back to New Zealand and went to Wellington, and eventually, over the years, a dialogue began to develop between the tribes and the Crown. But then in 1984, when the restructuring came on in a big way, uh, the crown devolved itself. So now it's a little bit hard still to find out who the crown is. Is the crown a district health board? Is the crown a school board of governors? Is the crown the Hamilton City Council? It's not quite clear who the crown is from the Maori point of view. The only thing you can be sure about, which, whichever office you're in, is the wrong office. <laughs> so. Although this, uh, this notion of partnership is a, uh, is a sound principle and it's been articulated by, by authority, authoritative people, making it work and identifying the partners, we're still in, in, in an exploratory state to a large extent with that. There are other principles as well, which I, uh, which I won't go into, except to note that uh, participation is one, that the expectation was that Māori would participate uh, fully in, in New Zealand's activities. And of course, the principle of protection, which is that the Crown always under, undertook to protect Māori interest in an active way. So there are, there are three principles that have been uh, much talked about, and particularly the, uh, the um, uh, that was the government's principles. But I just want, just want to uh, touch on another point before, uh, and it is this one, that apart from the principles, the other one to understand the, uh, the treaty is to talk about what the treaty actually provides for. And uh, if you look at this article by article, you see that Article 1 provides for the Crown's authority. You can argue about whether the, the authority is uh, based on sovereignty or based on the right of to govern, it might be a small shade of difference in practice, but whatever, for whatever reason, Article 1 gives the Crown some authority. The power of government comes from Article 1 of the treaty. If you want to govern a country, you can do it in two ways. You can, uh, you can come in with the guns blazing and take it by force, or you can sign a treaty and <laughs> take it another way. So uh, really, the legitimacy of the New Zealand government comes from Article 1 of the treaty, in theory. In practice, governments get legitimacy from just by hanging around long enough. And you know where there's, a, where there's a revolution around the world, 
and a rebel government comes in, New Zealand's first reaction is not to recognise the rebel government. But if they're still there in two or three years' time and we need another trading partner, we tend to recognise them. <laughs> but uh, the New Zealand governments, uh, uh, in theory, their authority comes from Article 1. Article 2 is about the authority that tribes have. And Article 3 is about the status of Māori people, not as tribal members, but as individual people. The problem is that the boundary between the power of government and the authority of tribes is not always very clear. And that's what the, the discussions that go on in Wellington day after day after day are all about. Where does the authority of the government end and where does the authority of tribes start? So there's one problem there. The other problem is where does the authority of tribes end and where does the status of Māori people as individuals start? And you may be familiar with some of the debate about the distribution of the assets of sea lords and New Zealand fishing rights, which is basically about that position. What are the relative rights of tribes as against Māori people as individuals? And so there's uh, some lack of clarity there. Well, now that uh, really was all I was wanting to uh, discuss with you this morning, was to give a background, first of all, to the Treaty of Waitangi a brief description of what the treaty actually says and how we, uh, how we tackle the problem of two different versions of the treaty and, and get a way that we can make progress on. What I was going to suggest then was that uh, there may be particular points now that you want to put on an agenda for us to discuss this afternoon. If there aren't, there are several other things I could do. But it might be useful if there are, and perhaps we could use that time at lunch to construct an agenda and to focus on those things uh, in the afternoon. So I might, uh, from my point of view, leave it there for now and, and uh, hand it back to Monty.